Well, good morning, Grace. Well, uh, you know, I want us to go back to the beginning, and uh, all the way to the very beginning, all right? Uh, all the way back in Yahweh's good and beautiful garden of Eden. Adam and Eve, they had it all, right? Intimacy with God, presence, fruitfulness, blessing. All they could ever want, all they could ever need, right there within their reach, right? Yet even with all within their reach, the two of them felt that they still needed to grasp for something else. You have it all, Eve, but the serpent wisdom speaks, did God really say? And just in a few words, the seed of doubt enters into their minds. God knows that if you eat from that fruit, right, if you merely reach out and grasp it for the fruit of knowledge of good and evil, You'll become like the divine beings, knowing all. And then the great tragedy, I think, which befalls all of mankind, begins at that moment. One that we would all fall prey to, the same fate as our ancestors did. And, you know, we saw with Eve, we saw the fruit. What happened? She saw the fruit. It looked pleasing to her eyes. And she what? And she took it. But it doesn't just stop with Eve, does it? Genesis chapter 6, not too long after. The sons of God saw the daughters of men, and they were desirous after them. And what did they do? They took them. They grasped them. Abraham and Sarah couldn't have a child, right? But Sarah says to Abraham, here is Hagar, my servant. And Abraham saw that that was a good proposition, that he looked good, and he took her. Jacob and Esau, right? Jacob saw that his brother had the blessing. His brother had the firstborn, the birthright. But what did he do? He saw it, desired it, and he took it. What about Samson, right? Samson, who's going along, and he sees a Philistine woman and it says that he saw in, that it was, she was right in his eyes, and he took her. And along the way, even there, he saw, on the way back from that, he saw along the way a lion with honey in it, and it looked good to his eyes. And even though it broke his Nazarite vow, he reached in and took it. When all the kings were going to war, David stayed home. And up on his palace, up on the roof of his palace, he looked down upon a woman, Bathsheba, who was bathing, and she looked good to his eyes. And what did David do? And he took her. And then Israelites, in their history of following after Yahweh God, they looked around at the nations all around them, and they saw that all the gods and the idols of the nations looked good to their eyes, and they what? They took them to be their own. We, as humans, have a problem. And it's one that the teacher in Ecclesiastes is going to share with us. And throughout the book, he lets us know that we have a problem with grasping after things. Grasping after what we think will give us meaning in life. Will give us purpose, will please us, will give us everything that we desire. And I think what the teacher is going to show us throughout this book is, uh, is this futility that comes grasping after the following. I, I made this little cycle of futility. I thought about calling it the, uh, the wheel of futility, but um, the cycle of futility. And then this is kind of where we're going to go. And this, you know, as you see this cycle that goes through, that humanity just comes and goes, as we looked at last time, right? It's never fulfilled. It's never, it doesn't matter. The, the wind blows and it comes back. The, the seas are filled, but then they, they are never satisfied. That over and over and over, humanity just keeps going through the same cycle of trying to find meaning. What do they try to find? And they do it by trying to grasp after what? Reward, grasping after time, grasping after power and resources and wisdom and immortality and control. And this is the, the path that we're going to be taking in these next few weeks 
as we go through the book of Ecclesiastes to see the futility of everything that we grasp after. But I ask, why is it that we grasp? Why is it that you and I, and we all struggle with this, why do we grasp after things? Why do we spend so much effort reaching beyond what is already given to us? I love this quote by Blaise Pascal. It says this in his Pentecost. He says, all men seek happiness. This is without exception. Whatever different means they employ, they all tend to this end. The cause of some going to war and of others avoiding it. It is the same desire in both, attended with different views. They will never, uh, this, the, the, the will never takes the least step but to this object. This is the motive of every action of every man or woman, put that in there, even those who hang themselves. We all are desiring and grasping after something. We all have this belief that if only I grasp this thing, then and only then will I be finally happy, right? If only I had this, my life would be complete. And in this lie is where Ecclesiastes, what it deems to expose. The lie that grasping after things in this life will lead to fulfillment, that once I have that thing, I will have enough, right? But we'll see over and over and over that it amounts to nothing more than grasping after the air. Try grasping after the air sometimes. You're going to have a failure at doing it. And so what I want to do this week is I want to look at that first grasping of going after reward in this life. And we're going to start in verses 12, and we're going to go all the way through chapter 20, uh, 226. Don't worry, I'm not going to read every one of those verses, but... So in starting in verse 12, we, we kind of have this switch in the author. What the, the author has been writing, the, the person who put this work together in verses 1 through 11, they have their frame, right? They're writing, and now it's turning to the words of the one that they're pinning out, they're, the one that they're taking their words, and they're going to start seeing this person. And meaning is going to be set on the, the two bookends by the frame narrator, and now they're going to see what does this person try to find meaning in all the way through life. And so the verses 13 through 18, the teacher, they set themselves up. Look at this. They set themselves up to try to find what is, and every one of us asks this, right? What is the meaning of life? What is it that's going to give us meaning? Why are we here? What do we live this life for? And the teacher, as we see, is going to set himself up as an authority to define the meaning in life. Note the focus as you look through these verses and flip through them. The focus of his learning and his seeking comes from where? Look, in verse 13, I decided, I concluded, I reflected, verse 14, I concluded, verse 16, I thought to myself, I have acquired, I decided to discern, I concluded. Chapter 2, I thought to myself, I said, I've done, I've thought, I've looked. And what does he set himself up as the ultimate authority of what's going to happen? Is the place that I find wisdom is right in here. He sets himself up as the authority to answer his questions that he has about the meaning of life. And what does he find again? Over and over, he's going to find throughout this whole book that it is all what? Futility. All. Hevel. Remember that word last week? Hevel. That there's futility. Vanity that there's nothing that gains in this life. Why? Because he's looking, which way for wisdom? Inside. And I think this is key to us understanding this book, is understanding where the teacher looks for his wisdom. And if you look in verse 13, he says, he's like, I decided thoroughly to examine all that has been accomplished on the earth, and yet I have concluded this. God has given people a what? A burdensome task that keeps them occupied. And why is, it this, why is the seeking out meaning of life, why is it burdensome? He kind of leaves that part out, does he not? But I think it goes back to the very first grasping in Genesis chapter 3, right, that we looked at earlier. Genesis chapter 3, the grasping and reaching out led to God saying about Adam and Eve, now that they know good and evil, we cannot allow them to eat from the tree of life any longer so that they may live forever in this state. And they are removed from the garden, right? 
because of the initial grasping. Because what did Adam and Eve do? They saw, they considered for themselves. They desired what? They saw that tree that was what? Wisdom, that was, good, that was goodness and evil, folly. They desired it. They grasped after it, and now they're kicked out. And humanity, he says in verse 15, now is like verse 15. What is bent cannot be straightened, and what is missing cannot be supplied. This is the reality because of what our ancestors did. This is the reality of where we find ourselves in humanity, that what is bent cannot be straightened. As much as you try, it's not going to happen. It's just the way it is, and we have to deal with it. We cannot fix it. Yet, what is the, the, uh, what is the teacher going to do? He's going to try all the more anyway. He's going to see, can I fix it even though I see that it's bent and can't be straight? And why does he do this? Because we seek after what? Reward. We seek fulfillment. But I think what we can do is we can take, I think he has a very poor understanding of what it's going to look like. I think he gets to the end of himself and finds out it's not so great. So instead of us trying to figure it out for ourselves, maybe, just maybe, we can do what? Learn from his mistakes. And let us look. We're going to look at three different ways. He says, I did it all, and basically says, let me save you just a little bit of time so you don't have to do it yourself. And he's going to show us three ways. Look at this. In verse, the first one is he's going to tell you that I know. I know, verses 16 through 18, and he's going to deal with the idea of wisdom. He says, verse 16, I've thought to myself, I have become much wiser than any of my predecessors who ruled over Jerusalem. I have acquired much wisdom and knowledge. So I decided to discern the benefit of wisdom and knowledge over foolish behavior and ideas. He says, I've gained more than anyone else. And if we do believe this was Solomon, it's said about Solomon that he what? He was the wisest person that ever lived. God, And he even asked God for wisdom. God said, I'll give you whatever you want. And instead of asking for riches, what does he ask for? Wisdom. And God gives him wisdom above any other person, plus the riches. He gives him that as well. He says, I've gotten anything any more than anybody else. Knowledge of good and evil, wisdom and folly. But let me ask you a question. That knowledge of wisdom and folly and good and evil, what did that benefit Adam and Eve? It didn't. What does it gain the, the, the teacher? Verse 18, I love this, for with great wisdom comes what? Great frustration. Whoever increases in knowledge merely increases his heartache. You know, I, you ever heard the, the phrase, ignorance is bliss, right? Sometimes it's true, right? Anybody, the more you learn sometimes, the more you start to see, the more you grow up. We talk about with children, we almost want to protect their what? They're innocents. I didn't have to use that word. We always think well, they're innocent, right? Because they don't know yet. And we do often, we try to protect because we know once they see and once we want them to grow in wisdom and understanding, but we also understand that as they grow, they're also going to grow in what? Heartache and difficulty and see the way the world really works. And I think that's a lot of times why we want to protect. And the, the author here, he says, I've gained it all and it only leads to pain. The more we know about life, the more of a burden it becomes. Amen? He says, so I I tried knowing. Well, I didn't just try knowing, but chapter 2, verses 1 through 8, he says, not only do I know, but I've I've looked at it and I want. I know I want. And he's going to look at the idea of seeking out the ideas of pleasures and materialism. Look at verses 1 through 3. He said, I thought to myself, come now, I will try self-indulgent pleasure to see if it's worthwhile. But I found what? It's, it's futility. I said of partying. It is folly and of self-indulgent pleasure. It accomplishes nothing. I thought deeply about the effects of indulging myself with wine. All the while, my mind was guided with wisdom. He's like, and I didn't drink too much. You know, I didn't get too, you know, where I got out of my mind. He's like, I even kept all my wisdom. This is his frat boy stage, in a sense. I, you want to think about that. He's going to go out, and he's going to drink. He's going to party. And he's not only going to do that. And the effects of behaving foolishly, look what else he's going to do. So then I might discover what's profitable for people to do on the earth during the few days of their life. And he's going to go on later. He's going to even talk about in verse 8. I amassed silver and gold for myself, valuable treasures. He's like, male singers, female singers. And what gives a man what? Sensual delight. 
a harem of beautiful concubines. So I was far wealthier than everyone else, yet I made my, uh, maintained my objectivity. So he's saying here, not only did I find it in the partying, not only in the alcohol, not only in the experiences, but I also found it in what? Now, the word we don't want to say in church. You can't say that. He found it in sex. I heard that. <laughs> hey, don't, think, uh, don't tell me that the Bible doesn't, you know, isn't real. He says, I'm going to find it in anything, in any pleasure you want to find. I'm going to find it in that. I went out and I did it. He says, in other words, enjoy yourself, pleasure of the fruit of your labor, eat, drink, be merry, tomorrow we die, right? But he finds out at the end of it all, pleasure, seeking that out, is what? Futility. Okay, well, that didn't work. I, I, I experienced it all, so that didn't work. Let me try something else in verses 4 through 8. Let me try to materialism. I increased my possessions. I built houses for myself. I planted vineyards. I designed gardens parks for myself. I planted all kinds of fruit trees. I conscript, uh, constructed pools of water to irrigate my grove and flourishing trees. I purchased male and female slaves. I owned slaves who were born to my house. I possess more livestock, both herds and flocks, than any predecessor in Jerusalem. I amassed silver and gold, as well as valuable treasures taken from the kingdom and provinces. I, I mean, you name it, I had it. And it's interesting, what is he building here? Interestingly, you look at some of the things I built, I planted, I grew a garden. I had, you know, I'm at, you know, I had silver and gold and precious jewels and flowing with water, fruit trees. He's building what? His own Eden. I'm going to try to go back and see if I can get back whenever Adam and Eve were stopped. I can make my way back. I'm going to build my own Eden, right? I'm going to own it here. I'm going to amass all, he says, build, plant, grow, gain, control. Amass all you can. But where does it lead? When I reflected, you know, he said, all of my accomplishments in verse 10, I didn't restrain for myself getting whatever I wanted. Look at that. Verse 10, I didn't restrict myself from anything that I wanted. If I wanted it, I what? Took it. Men with power and people with power love to take because they can't. I didn't deny myself anything that would bring me pleasure. So all my accomplishments gave me joy. This was my reward for my, all my effort. What's he saying here? I won it all, and I got it all. Nothing was withheld from me. Verse 9 and 10, he, I mean, and I think I, I kind of skipped into this. But not only did he want, verses 9 and 10, and seeing this is, I was far wealthier than all my predecessors. He's like, Yet my, I, you know, I uh, restrain, or sorry, I maintain my objectivity. Nine and ten. Not only did he say, "I know, I want," but he says, "I am." This is me. I am the pinnacle of mankind. Every man wants to have all the material, all the wealth, all of the things, all of the pleasures, all the experience, all the knowledge, all the intelligence. I am it. In other words, I am. And I've even created my own Eden. I am. You name it, I have reached the pinnacle. I withheld nothing for myself. Why? Because of the fruit of my labors. I earned it. So who does it belong to? Me. Genesis 3, 6 and 7. If I can get there. It is a problem for all of us this morning. It's switching. <laughs> now, when the woman saw that the tree produced fruit and that it was good for food, it was attractive to the eye and was desirable for making one wise, she took some of that fruit and ate it. But she also gave it to her husband, who was right there with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. The grasping and taking that Adam and Eve had when they saw it all look good left them nowhere but what? Naked. Totally exposed for the world with nothing to cover. How often do we say, right, I worked hard. I deserve this. I deserve it. And we, what do we do along the way? We use P 
people and we use possessions and we use anything to get what we want. Why? And we throw ourselves into our identity and we convince ourselves that we deserve every single bit of it. This is the fruit of my labor. I have tried it. But where does all that leave us? He says, I know, I want, I am, but he realizes in verse 7, yet when I reflected on everything I had accomplished and all the effort that I had expended on it to accomplish it, I wore myself out doing it. I concluded all of these achievements and possessions are ultimately profitless, hebel, like chasing the wind, and there is nothing gained from them on earth. Not only he realized, and this is the pivot, is that no longer, when he feel it, figured it all out, he says, actually realized that I have not. It gained him nothing. It's like grasping after the air. But not only does he say, I have not, but he says, he starts to realize that after all this, that verses 12 through 23, that I am not. He goes all the way back, you know, to his, you know, to goes goes back to his fallback, does he not? And you see it over and over. Verse, you know, thirteen, uh, you know, starts to get, or sorry, twelve. Next, I decided to consider wisdom as well as foolish behavior. He goes back to his fallback. Well, none of that stuff made it. None of that stuff mattered to me. It didn't fulfill me. So I'm just going to go back to wisdom as opposed to folly. And he does learn along the way a little bit, right? For what more can the king's successor do than what the king's already done? I realize that wisdom is preferable to folly, just as light is preferable to darkness. He does find a little bit, right? There is something preferable. Better to live in wisdom than to live in folly. Don't be a fool. Don't live in darkness. Because why? Verse 14, the wise man can see where he's going, but the fool walks in darkness. Yet I also realized that what? The great equalizer. Reality creeps back in one more time, even though he can walk in wisdom as opposed to folly. Reality creeps back in. The great equalizer is what? Death. And where does he end up? Verse 17, after all this, so I loathed life. Because what happens on earth seems awful to me. For all of the benefits or wisdom are futile like chasing after the wind. I get to the end of it, and I just, it's like the spoiled child, right? You ever get the, you know, anybody have the kid that when they don't get what they want, now all of a sudden they're going to be what? I don't want that thing anymore. I hate that thing. Or I'm going to destroy it for somebody else even, right? That's what my younger son loves to do with my older. Anytime he doesn't get what he wants, he's going to go destroy it. That's his way. Like children, I can't have it, so I hate it. Not only life. But all that he's worked for, verses 18 through 23. Everything I've worked for, he comes in and he says, I hate it all. Forget it. I'm just done with it. And he says, I hate life. Why? Because ultimately he comes to the conclusion that it's all what? Pointless. No matter what you gain, it all goes away the moment you you do, you gain it. It's all going to burn up in the end. And I think what the teacher's doing here is he's living out that serpentine wisdom that goes back to Genesis chapter 3. And following that wisdom that the serpent loves to say in our ears of grasping what looks good in our eyes to fulfill us, to make us God-like, because that's what man ascribes to often, is to be God-like, leaves us ultimately empty because it's all futile. Because like the garden, grasping leads to death and it leads to separation. Every time we grasp, we grasp a little bit. We think we grasp life. They had the tree of what? That they could eat from freely? The tree of life. Yet they chose to grasp after the tree that would bring death. And so he comes to his conclusion in in verses 24 through 26. So I've said in all, my mind can't relax. Even the things that I I work for, the things that I've gained, I don't even know when I die. It might go to to my son who's a, a really good son who takes care of it. It might go to a fool who spends every bit of everything I work for gone like that. And I have no control over it. 
I'm just done. He says, so what I come, there's nothing better for people than to eat and drink and find enjoyment in their work. I also perceive that this ability to find enjoyment comes from God. For no one can eat and drink or experience joy apart from him. For to the one who pleases him, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and joy. But the sinner, he gives the task of amassing wealth only to give it to the one who pleases God. The task of the wicked is, wicked is futile like chasing after the wind. He says, whenever it comes to the end of it, he says, all I can tell you, and I think this is the reality of where the author, the person in the, the middle here comes to, is this conclusion, is that all I can do, just might as well take today, you, don't, you aren't promised tomorrow, you don't know what gonna, tomorrow's going to bring anyway, tomorrow's death, so just today, I guess go ahead and enjoy it. If there's anything that God gives us, at least he gives us that. Because remember earlier, he said it's a burden of some task that God gives us to try to do all this. So all I'm going to do, I'm just going to enjoy it while it lasts. But it's just that, because it won't last. And as depressing as this is, right? Again, new people, welcome to grace. <laughs> it's kind of the point. Left to ourselves... Under the sun, seeking out things under the sun, left to ourselves, there is no hope. It is all futile. I don't care what you try to find it in. You start grasping and you will find nothing. You think you're grabbing onto it, but you're grabbing nothing but the air. It's a pretty dismal outlook. Remember verse 15? Put that back up there. What is bent? 115, what is bent, what? Cannot be straightened. And what is missing cannot be supplied. This is the life that you and I have under the sun on earth. This is what we can get is nothing but bent, crooked nothingness. But the beauty is what? We're not left alone. We are not left to ourselves. There is one who has come into this world who was completely straight, that was perfect in his straightness, who entered into this crooked world that we live in, one who was not bent by this broken world, one who was tempted yet without what? Sin. And this one that was straight the problem is, is he's straight, but you and I are living in a crooked world, and what are we? We're crooked. And it's interesting, kind of tilting our world, as we saw him as he came into this world, he looks peculiar, does he not? Because we think in ourselves, in our world, that we are the ones that are straight. And when he entered in and did not look like we did, we considered him bent and broken. And so what do we do? We had him killed. And the perfect one was placed on a crooked tree for all to see. And why was that? As, for, as 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, the one who knew no sin became sin. Why? that we might become the righteousness of God. This one, Jesus, took the futility and the vanity upon himself, and he gave it meaning, and he gave it purpose. He is in the process of straightening this world out, and one day he will put it all completely to rights. So our only purpose in this life as to knowing and pleasing the one who created us. All else in this life is futility. So I want to leave you with this one last thought. I want you to ask yourselves, and I asked myself this, what am I striving for in this life? Ask yourself, what am I striving for in this life? What am I desiring? What am I looking for? What am I 
protecting? What am I nurturing in this life? Do I believe that I have enough in Christ? Or am I substituting something else for Him in order to bring me the satisfaction and the fulfillment that I want? And I can tell you, if you haven't found that satisfaction in Christ, you will be left wanting. I don't want to mix words. I don't apologize for that. You don't know Christ, you will be left, just like the author here, the teacher who says everything is futile and there's nothing more than just to just exist until one day I'm laid in the dirt and it doesn't matter anymore. That's where it's going to lead you. I won't mince words to you on that. I believe that there is only hope in the one who is perfect. So I want to leave you with the words of a song that I told you Pax loves to sing. The great poet of our day, Kanye West. <laughs> and a song that he sings, Everything We Need. I want you to watch this. Well, I'll put it up here. Watch how it goes from enjoy yourself to put it back. Why? Listen. I'll do my best. Ashley said, you're not allowed to wrap it. It's hard not to wrap it sometimes. And I'm not going to do that because I'm not even good at that. But look at this, how he says this. He says, and notice verse 1, it's going to go one way. And verse 2, it's going to go the other. Switch your, switch your attitude. Go ahead, level up yourself. This, that, different latitude. Life too short. Go spoil yourself. Feel that feel. Enjoy yourself. Why? Because we have everything we need. What does that sound like? Sounds a lot like Ecclesiastes, doesn't it? Go out and find it all, because you have everything you need to enjoy it all. But the next verse, I love this. Switch my, switch my attitude. I'm so, I'm so radical. All these people mad at dude. This for who it mattered to. What if Eve made apple juice? You going to do what Adam do? Or say, baby, let's put this back on the tree. Why? Because we have everything we need. Do you find everything you need in Christ? I don't need that. I put it back on the tree. Let's pray.